All right, everyone, my name is Peter Pekarczyk, and today we'll be talking about making music with React. By the way, Utah has been awesome. I've never been here before, but it's freaking awesome. Uh, so I'm trying something fun and something new. Uh, this isn't something that I do full time. This is just something that I do on the side. Um, uh, React with music is going to be something, we'll have a lot of cool demos. I'm going to be cramming a lot into this talk, <laughs> a lot of different definitions. Uh, there's a lot that we have to talk about before I can get to React, but I do promise a lot of cool YouTube videos and demos so you guys don't get too bored. Anyway, you're probably wondering, how do you pronounce my last name? Pi Car Chick. Uh, I'm a UI engineer at Trunk Club, and I had the pleasure of speaking at JSConf this past year about migrating Backbone apps to React. It was a fun time. So if you're wondering why I'm dressed so well, it's because I work at Trunk Club. Our slogan is, men hate to shop, but they love to look good. We set, you, we set you up with a stylist. Uh, sh she'll talk to you about uh, what you do, uh, how you like to get dressed, and then she'll send you a whole bunch of clothing. Uh, you keep what you like, you return what you don't like. Women, we've got Trunk Club for Women coming too, so it's, it's a pretty exciting time. In terms of our tech stack, React, Babel, Alt, McFly, Reflux, Webpack, um, between the three UI engineers, we've got 10 single page apps that talk to a bunch of microservices. Uh, two customer-facing apps and eight internal apps, everything from finance to warehouse, packing and shipping a trunk, uh, finding the right clothing for you. That's something I work on. And we promised to do something crazy a few weeks ago. Uh, we promised to stick to a framework and use it for at least a whole year. Uh, <laughs> we had several different implementations of Flux going around. CoffeeScript was still lingering. Uh, the UI team was moving much faster than the people we needed to support, so we made the decision to not be the butt of every joke. Um, but most importantly, why am I here today? Why am I here right now? So React is definitely simplifying the developer experience, right? But the community talks about it in terms of the traditional website experience. You talk to a server, you get some data, data changes, re-render your component. Um, but React can just do much more than just render your website. Um, and React Native has been a great example of doing that too, right? It introduced iOS development for people that just know JavaScript and React. Uh, I kind of want to th take things to another level and uh, build an ecosystem around audio. I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of cool stuff we can do. So where did the, all this excitement start? About a year ago, Chrome Stable released the Web Audio API. Audio synthesis directly in your browser. Uh, you could create sounds, uh, you can create music, you can do whatever you wanted to do. But the thing was, you were still stuck tapping keys on your keyboard. As a musician, that's not the best instrument, right? Uh, so about a year later, the Chrome Stable released the MIDI API. That means you can plug an instrument, something like this, directly to your uh, computer and place it directly in the browser. Think about the potential this opens up, us up to. A virtual instrument right in your browser, you got the potential to collaborate, make music, share music, you do whatever you want, just like you share websites already. Uh, my background with music, I grew up playing the piano, a violin and piano and absolutely hated it. Uh, <laughs> started violin in the first grade. Uh, it was cool until about uh, the third grade when I lost the first violin seat. Uh, can you blame me though? You can only play hot cross buns so many times in front of your parents. Uh, and I didn't think music, was, music making was cool again until about high school when I discovered music making apps. Uh, so I was a huge nerd back then. Uh, when I wasn't screwing around with Dreamweaver and Photoshop, I was making music in Fruity Loops. It was a cool time. And it actually paid off in college when I was able to DJ at a bunch of local bars and make $100 for a Saturday night. Five hours of DJing, I was a millionaire back then. Uh, so I focused on making music for a while. But then I had to take a break when I took when I realized I had to take engineering a little more seriously so I can get a job after I graduate. And just recently rekindled that relationship. Uh, for your viewing pleasure, here's a picture of me, freshman year, circa 2009, uh, DJing a house party. I am so glad I'm behind that, or I'm past that stage of my life. So what does it take to make music? Better yet, what does it take to make sound? I want to guide you guys through the process of creating a basic instrument in the browser, like a synthesizer, for example. So what is a synthesizer? Uh, think of electronic piano with a bunch of different knobs and oscillators. Um, you've got oscillators, envelopes, modulations, and of course the keys that you press. The picture that you see up here is uh, a Moog Voyager Excel. It's a hardware synthesizer. It's a music making machine in a box. It's got the signature Moog uh, warm sound. Um, these things were super popular in the 70s and 80s along with a wide variety of other synths too, like 
Yamaha, Roland, uh, they, all, they all made a whole bunch. And they usually start with an initialized patch, right? So when you first th turn the thing on, it's got one oscillator, no sound effects, or no features. And this was the signature initialized sound. Back then, you had a lot of hardware, a lot of parts, right? These were all physical things with circuits. So uh, the enclosure that you had could totally affect the sound that you get. And Move was super well known for its wooden frames and its rich, warm sound. I want to demonstrate that for you guys uh, with this short video. pretty cool, right? Super rich sounds, and this is for like super rich people too. This thing's like $5,000. It's insane. <laughs> uh, but very exciting sound effects. And I mentioned something about oscillators and envelopes, right? If you were watching this video, you could see the guy. He wasn't just pressing the key on the keyboard. He was twisting some knobs. Um, you can call that an oscillator. What is an oscillator? It's just a device for generating oscillation or oscillating electric currents. It's a fancy word for something that moves back and forth. Electronic oscillators make voltages. A zero to five volts, for example. And there's all different types of oscillators in the world, right? We have oscillators that generate sound waves. Um, there's a pendulum, radio waves. Your CPU has oscillators, right? Um, you can use them everywhere. And the tool we use to visualize these oscillators is called an oscilloscope. Um, that's what you see up here. That happens to be a square wave. Um, there's obviously a lot more I can get into about this, but I want to show you guys a few basic visualizations and then let you hear the sound, too, so you can get an idea of what an oscillator generates. So the first one we have is a sine wave. I'm taking you guys back to high school calc. Uh, you used to have to graph these things on your TI-83 calculators, right? When you zoom in on a sound wave, this is what a sine wave looks like. Uh, the one I'm about to play for you is 440 hertz. That's the frequency. And it generates an A note. Um, so this is what it sounds like. Super subtle, super simple. If you remember the hearing test we used to take back in elementary school, they used the same exact sound. Uh, so the next one, the next basic one is a sawtooth wave. You can probably guess why it's called the sawtooth. It's because it looks like a sawtooth. This one's a little more intense. Uh, brace yourselves. Oh, that's quieter than I thought. Nice. Uh, and then lastly, square wave. So same idea. It's shaped like a square. And it sounds like that. So what's the relationship between a synthesizer and an oscillator? Uh, a great analogy that I came up with is the tuning fork. Um, I'm sure you recognize one of these. If you don't, the idea is simple. You take a tuning fork, you bang it against something, the poles start uh, shaking and vibrating and emit a frequency, and that frequency just happens to be a note. The width and height of each side uh, decide the speed of the vibration and the note that it's going to uh, emit. So think of the synthesizer in this case, the instrument as the tuning fork, and the vibrations that come from one of these as the oscillator. Um, in the tuning fork's case, this instrument is immutable. Talk about a perfect buzzword to use here. You can't change the frequency or the sound, <laughs> and it'll always play the exact same frequency. Finally, uh, we're going to talk about envelopes, right? Envelopes are a super important part of sound, and they break down into four different stages. The attack, the time from zero to maximum amplitude, your peak energy, um, and everything generates an attack a guitar string, a kick, a snare, the snap of your fingers. Um, a low attack is a great example, uh, or snapping your fingers is a great, a great example of a low attack, right? You snap it, you hear the sound instantly. Uh, a high attack, you hear the sound gradually increase, right? The next one in that process is a decay. Decay is a little harder to hear, but no, it's there. Uh, a lot of electronic dance music uses decay when they morph and mutate sounds. Uh, but when it comes to a classical instrument, you don't really hear much decay. And what decay does is it takes you from that maximum peak that you hit with the attack and normalize it to a more sustained level, right? Um, and that's where sustain comes in. Sustain is the body of your sound, the sound that you're usually hearing when you hear an instrument. Violins are a great example, right? As you pull your bow across the string at a constant speed, you're sustaining that note and you're hearing it for a longer time. And then finally, when you release that note, um, you get into something called the release phase, right? It's the time it takes from that normalized sound to hit zero. A great example of this, too, is a guitar pluck. As soon as you pluck your string, the sound doesn't abruptly end. It still resonates for a while, right? That is a great example of release. 
So now you must be wondering, Peter, how do I do this on my computer? What do I need to make music on my machine? Well, that's called a digital audio workstation. The one that you see up on the screen is Ableton, but there's a whole bunch of them. Um, you've probably heard of GarageBand. It comes on every Mac. Logic is its more powerful, expensive brother. Uh, and there's a bunch of other ones. Like I said, Ableton is really big in the electronic dance music scene. Free Loops is huge for rap uh, artists. Lil Wayne, made Pro, or Lil Wayne made Pro Tools famous, but it's sort of dying off now. And Bitwig is supposed to be there to replace it. The uh, best way you can think about DAW is a DAW is a framework you can use to create music. There's lots of them, right? You've got a variety to choose from. That's something we're used to in the JavaScript realm, right? Lots of things to choose from. No one says you have to use one. No one says you have to use a JavaScript framework either. We're all, we've all seen global variables before, right? So now let's, let's demo some of that stuff. I've been talking about all this stuff. Uh, so I created a simple DAW in the browser. It's one oscillator, which is a React component, and five audio parameters, attack, decay, sustain, release, and volume, just in case it gets a little loud. All these, in, all these uh, components live inside uh, an instrument component, the source of truth. The oscillator and audio parameter make up a synthesizer. The synthesizer lives in the browser, which we can call our DAW. OK, here we go. So now, here we go. If I just press a note on my keyboard, No sound anymore. In any case, if I were to press a note, oh, there we go. <laughs> OK, cool. So as I press a note on my keyboard, this is just a normal triangle wave um, at 165 hertz, which is an E note. Um, to demonstrate attack, say I move this attack all the way down. See, you hear the sound instantly. It almost makes a plucking sound at first. Now if I increase that, It's a little more subtle, right? It takes a gradual, it, it gradually increases. Uh, like I said, decay is a little harder to demonstrate for a single oscillator, but sustain is definitely there. So, sustain at its current value. As I increase the sustain, the body of the sound increases too. It's a little more rich. And then finally, release. So just like you have the attack that builds the sound, the release breaks it down. So a short release, it ends abruptly, right? But a long release sort of subtly makes that sound go away, right? All right, so we've talked about how to make a basic instrument. What can we use this for? So, Browser-based games are becoming a reality, right? You've probably seen the Unreal Engine in Firefox. You may have heard of Chrome Racer that Google came up with, and then Angry Birds for Chrome. These are all games that are already utilizing the Web Audio API to render all their sounds. Now, how does that improve the, the gaming developer experience, right? Um, you can do a lot of cool things. You can update uh, sound effects on the fly. You don't, you don't have to bring in an MP3 file anymore. There's a lot that goes on in a game, right? Audio is obviously a huge feature of games. You've got all the sound effects, the background music, uh, and there's numerous amounts. You can have a game has thousands and thousands of different sounds. You don't have to compile an MP3 anymore and import it into the browser. You can create as many sounds as you need to and then just manipulate them on the fly. It's cheaper to create an oscillator in the browser than it is to import another MP3. I want to demo the Chrome Racer game for you. It's pretty cool. If you have a second after this talk, check it out. Uh, and the way it works is you connect a bunch of different phones together. Uh, you place them next to each other, and it creates a racetrack. As more and more people uh, join the game, it generates new sounds and makes it a more dynamic experience, right? Um, it's pretty exciting. Pretty cool, right? All those sounds were dynamically generated right on your phone. So now, finally, we've talked about the basics of creating a sound. We've talked about the gaming developer experience. Uh, now let's talk about the music making experience, the producing experience. And guess what? Making music is kind of a pain in the butt. You've got gigabytes and gigabytes of synthesizers, sound packs, beats, a whole bunch of stuff. 
chances are it's not all going to fit on your one terabyte Mac hard drive, so you get a bunch of external hard drives. Uh, as soon as you disconnect that hard drive and reconnect it, the software is going to have to look through that whole hard drive to remap the sounds again. It gets kind of annoying. You'll end up b building a dedicated music-making computer, but that's not the best when it comes to convenience, right? Portability is tough at that point. Imagine having to check Facebook on only one personal desktop computer, right? If that was the case, we probably wouldn't be here right now. We'd probably be hanging out in our parents' basement using this thing. Uh, but luckily, we don't have to do that. And you don't, need to use, you don't need everything to create music. When you're coming up with a tune, you're iterating and iterating a synthesizer. Just like you might edit your CSS in a React component, you're doing the same thing with sound. You're increasing the attack, increasing the decay, adding numerous oscillators, changing the timing on all of those oscillators so they start and end at different times, right? The most you'll ever need is a server that'll feed you some sounds and let you tweak them. Um, there's no point in there's no point in opening up a whole digital audio workstation to make that happen. So finally, back to the real world. Portability of moving on your laptop and desktop is hard, so you try to collaborate online. But guess what? Sharing projects is a hassle. High, there's such high latency. You're not, just sending, uh, uh, you're not just sending small pieces of information to the other person. You're sending the GUI interface. You're sending the actual files, uh, the audio files, over to whoever you're working on this with causing latency to be super high. Dependencies are worse than NPM. It's awful. Uh, you need to have a, a, an exact copy of the directory and structure on that machine. Otherwise, things will start breaking on you. So imagine trying to collaborate on a Mac with someone that uses Windows. It doesn't really work out that well. Um, it's pretty annoying. You get a bunch of different error messages constantly. You can use Dropbox. You can use Ableton. You can do whatever you want. Uh, and things just start breaking on you left and right. So now finally. I promise this is the last definition, and then we get to the fun stuff. What is MIDI? MIDI is the musical in instrument digital interface. Um, you can chain multiple instruments together or just connect one to your machine. It's the standard means of communicating between your browser or between your instruments or a computer. Um, it's been around for much longer than EDM has been around for, um, and it was actually standardized in 1983. There were so many synthesizers out there, uh, the whole experience sucked for musicians because you needed different cables, uh, different wires, different protocols to make things work. So this is what a MIDI uh, adapter used to look like. USB is more or less taking over that scene now, but the protocol is still the same. And what does that protocol carry? It carries event messages, notation, pitch, and velocity. Um, it's the note that you're pressing, how hard you're pressing it, and then which key you're pressing. A great way to think about MIDI is JSON. Um, it's a set of instructions. You can create and edit a song in a few hundred lines. It's easy to modify and manipulate. Um, in the sense that JSON gives you the state of your website, MIDI gives you the state of your music. It's like the data layer for your UI. A great way to think about MIDI, it's the sheet music for your computer. So on the left side here, we have the lovely sheet music for Final Fantasy VI in, in a human-readable format. And then on the right side, you've got the same thing in MIDI format. So I want to demo how MIDI actually works. I will play you one of my favorite songs. So the cool thing about MIDI is, when you open up a MIDI track inside of a DAW like GarageBand, what it'll try to do is map all the different instruments to whatever instrument you have locally on your computer. It's pretty smart that way. Um, it's good to remember that MIDI does not define the sound that you want to hear. It just tells you what to play it, not how to play it. Sounds pretty familiar, right? So if you're ever in the business of starting an elevator music company, all you have to do is download a MIDI file and throw it into GarageBand, and you're golden. <laughs> so now, Peter, come on. Where does React come into play? So as you probably already guessed, synthesizers have a lot of state. DAWs have a lot of state. And we all know React is great at state. So let's get started. Let's come up with a simple oscillator component that we could use. Now, this may seem like a lot of code. Uh, but there's a few important features here. We have the audio context, which is the audio API. Uh, we, connect, uh, we create an oscillator, and then we connect it to, that, to the audio context. And then we just start it. It's pretty easy to do. 
In this case, we have an oscillator component. Um, it's React, and all it returns is a knob with uh, the oscillator settings, right? We want to have the ability to change this oscillator on the fly in the browser. So pretty easy. It's worth noting, too, that when you create an oscillator, you have to kill one, too. Uh, otherwise, it'll hang around in memory, cause a bunch of memory leaks, something that you don't want to get into. So if you do start messing around with this, make sure you disconnect that oscillator, too. Now, what does an oscillator component look like for you? There's a lot happening behind the scenes, but we don't necessarily need to see all that, right? Uh, this is what an oscillator component would look like. You pass in the type that comes from your instrument. You pass in the context, which is the audio API. And then you pass in uh, two callbacks on press note and on release note. It's pretty simple to use, and I'll talk more about this in just a second. So we mentioned attack, decay, release, sustain, envelopes. Those deserve their own uh, component as well. And in this case, I call it audio param. You pass in the type, you pass in the value from your instrument component, and then just a simple on change handler when you do change the UI. And then it's as easy as passing down those things and having an update on its own. So I wrap both these things inside of an instrument component, right? This component is where you want the source to, of truth to live, right? We can add as many oscillators as we want. We can come up with our initialized sound like we talked about earlier. Uh, so when you open up a browser, you can start playing instantly. Now, what does a bird's eye view look like of this happening? So we have state. In this case, we've got two different oscillators. Uh, we have a sustain parameter. Um, and then just on press and on release note, which is, in our case, as soon as you press a key, it creates an oscillator. And as you let go, it kills the oscillator. And all a violin and piano is is a bunch of sound waves, right? What we're doing here is recreating those sounds, those sound waves as best we can, just in the browser. So I was doing all this, and I thought the MIDI API was easy, but I thought it could be a little easier. So I made a little bit of a MIDI API bridge, right? Uh, I wanted the experience to be, I want to plug in my keyboard, I want to pick an oscillator and start playing tunes. Uh, I do that through a series of different methods. So I gave you a couple of helper methods. Remember on press and on release? This is what you'll bind into inside JS MIDI. And it's simple to use. I also offer an event note to frequency method because the sound that you're getting from your MIDI device isn't exactly a frequency. You can't really use that when using an oscillator to generate a sound. And it works pretty easily. The first thing we do, we request MIDI access from the browser. If you have it, you have the on MIDI success callback, which basically says, hey, you've got MIDI. That's great. On fail, you can't really do much. I'm sorry. Uh, but chances are you have it, because it isn't Chrome stable. So we bind an on MIDI state change. Behind that scenes, that com communicates with the MIDI message that comes from the device. Um, and the difference between what the MIDI API does and what I do is I tweak the data just a little bit so you get only what you need. A MIDI, uh, the MIDI transfers a lot of different information that you don't necessarily need to make music. So I sort of clear out the noise and just give you the notes and the frequencies. As soon as you press a key on your keyboard, we hit note on. And then as soon as you let go, note off. Just two simple helper methods. You don't even need to interact with these. I take care of it for you right out of the box. And then lastly, frequency from note. To make this all happen in a React component, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is place something like this in your constructor, bind on press note and on release note, and we're good to go. So let's demo that. So say, say for instance, you, are, you have a new startup, right? A new startup idea. Uh, you, hit up, you hit up Sandwich Video. They're trying to make you to pay $50,000 for a video. You're like, screw that. I can do this on my own. So what do you do? You open up the DAW browser and get started. Just so we know that we're interacting with MIDI, we have this message pop up on our screen right now. As soon as we disconnect the controller from our machine, we get an event message, right? We've disconnected it with the manufacturer and the model of the keyboard. As soon as we reconnect it, we're good to go. So I'm pressing a key right now, right? Uh, we know the state of it. We've released it. If we're pressing it, we have press and the frequency playing as well as the key and the note. And it's pretty cool. We can do all sorts of cool things with MIDI. So we talked about making uh, a simple startup video sound, right? They're pretty familiar. Hi, I'm Jim Young, the founder of Tattoos for Babies, a new way 
I'm seeing your baby. Right? How easy was that? We did it, and we just saved $50,000. Now you can hire me. All right. Uh, the last thing I want to show you guys is this Victor synth. It was sort of the motivation for turning this stuff into a React component. I got to say it's pretty awesome. It's not React, but very cool. Uh, it was a little hard to follow, uh, which is why I was like, we can turn this into something greater, something much more interesting. And finally, uh, the original MIDI synth. So shout out to Chris Wilson. He's the one that helped us out and gave us the MIDI API in the browser. Uh, and he helped me a little bit, too, for making this stuff. So I got to give him a shout out. Uh, lastly, thank you guys. Thanks to Matt and Jameson for putting this together. Uh, and I hope you guys like this talk. Feel free to check it out. Uh, I have this all on React MIDI on GitHub. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Follow me on GitHub. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>